to give everybody time to get in. Hope everybody's doing well. I know I've said that a couple times, um, but I hope everybody's doing well. I'm sitting a little bit closer to the computer, so I'll be able to say hi to everybody. So Denise, Richard, uh, Deborah, uh, Lynette, and then we've got Christine and Eileen and Marty and uh, Kathy and Beth. So everybody, welcome. Um, so Beth already said trying to grow a lemon tree. Well, that's what we're going to talk about. So today I'm going to be talking about growing citrus. Um, it's a very, very fun plant to grow. Um, it is uh, one that we need a little bit of more information on, and that's why we wanted to do this webinar, uh, because it's, it's not something that you can go plant outside. So it's not a fruit tree that you can go plant outdoors, uh, like an apple tree or something like that. Citrus typically is going to grow anywhere between zones 9 and 11. Um, and 9 is kind of pushing it a little bit. 8 is where we are here in the Hampton Roads area, 8A. Um, and that is definitely not going to uh, buy, uh, do very well for uh, citrus growing outdoors in the landscape. Now, some people have done it. I've heard some people have success stories. The downfall is, let's say we have four or five good winters um, and you're doing great. And then all of a sudden we have that really, really cold winter come through um, and that can severely damage your citrus trees. And so uh, what we have always recommended is growing them in containers and they're great container plants because you get to enjoy them indoors. I love growing indoor plants. Indoor plants are so much fun to grow. Um, and to grow an indoor plant that also produces something that you can eat and use in desserts and drinks and cocktails and all that stuff um, is so much fun, not to mention the fragrance of the bloom. So I'll talk about that in a little bit um, when we get to that section of, of this webinar. But uh, they're so fragrant. It's a gorgeous, glossy green leaf. So you can see this big one here right behind me. Great looking, kind of shrubby. You can grow them as trees, bonsais. You can do lots of different things with them. They're a lot of fun and they produce something that you can eat. And it's very, very rewarding to do that, um, especially you know, in the winter when we're kind of stuck in our homes. Uh, it's a great thing to kind of be able to grow something that's going to produce fo food for you um, and just make it very, very enjoyable. Um, so as I mentioned, we want to watch the temperature on your citrus. So that's, that's probably one of the most important things um, is citrus cannot be grown outside. Um, uh, so, so I see Janet says my calamundin is doing uh, uh, well inside this year, great. So that's what we're gonna talk about too with citrus is you can grow them indoors year round or you can take them outside for a summer vacation and bring them back in. And so there's lots and lots of versatility there too. Um, I, I love growing indoor plants. I, I think my hope is that I can always just keep them indoors because I don't have to fluctuate the temperatures. I don't have to change its environment too much. Um, but summer or outdoor is where these plants were designed to grow. Uh, you know, you know, Mother Nature didn't intend for plants to be grown indoors. We're the ones that are, that are doing that, and some plants can tolerate it and do very, very well. Um, especially when you find the right location. I always tell people that with indoor plants. If you've got a great location inside your home and your plants are doing great, you don't need to move them. But if your plant is struggling a little bit, it's a great idea to take it outside. That's gives gives it, you know that 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 nature that it needs, uh, a little tender loving care, and just take it outside and give it a little bit of warmth in that summer vacation, then bring it back in during the winter. And I do that with a lot of plants. I'll take them outside, bring them back in during the winter. Um, and, uh, and, and, and so Janet said it's not doing well. So we're, we're gonna help you uh, make it a little bit better, Janet, uh, hopefully with uh, all my tips and tricks here that I'm gonna talk about. Uh, but it's a, it's a great thing to be able to take your plants outside sometimes um, uh, if they need it, if they need a little bit of revival, it really, really helps. All right, so what I wanna talk about first is picking the right citrus plant for you. Um, so there's lots and lots of different types of citrus out there. Think about what you use the most, um, you know, when you're cooking, uh, whether you use lemons on your salad and tea, uh, in desserts, limes. So we've got lemons, limes, oranges, calamundins, kumquats. Those are kind of some of the most uh, basic, you know, you know, mainstays of your indoor citrus plants. All of our citrus plants and, and most citrus plants that you're going to grow um, are going to be in the dwarf uh, families uh, or, or be a dwarf uh, a, a variety so that you can grow them in containers for very many years. Um, so there's lots and lots of choices out there. There's lots of different varieties too. I'm going to maybe get into the varieties at the end if I, if I have time. Um, I don't want to, to try and go on too long, but if I have time, I'll talk about a couple varieties at least. Maybe I'll go through the ones that we have in stock right now. Um, so 
Think about the type of, of, of plant that you want to grow and the one that you're going to use the most, especially if you're starting from scratch. If this is your first one, um, then you know definitely it's a good thing to say, okay, if I'm going to buy the first plant, my first indoor citrus plant, then uh, think about the one that you're going to use the most because then you'll be a little bit more apt to kind of care for it a little bit more. All right, so then the next thing is light. Of course, sunlight is very, very important. Think about where citrus trees grow naturally in orchards and getting full, full bright sun. Indoors, it's hard to capture that. So think about the area that you're gonna grow it in indoors. Um, and this might determine how you're gonna grow it as well. So, the, and what I mean by this is, um, so think about what, which room you want to grow your citrus plant in. Is it, does it have a south facing window? Does it have a window that's gonna get a majority of the sun all the way through the, the day for the entire year? And that's what the south facing window is gonna, gonna give you. Um, is that full, full sun effect, gives you a lot of bright light. The plant doesn't necessarily need to be sitting right in that window. It just needs to be in that room. It needs to be able to get a good amount of natural light coming in through the windows. The west side would be your next best option. So the west side is, is gonna get that, that really, really bright afternoon sun. Uh, east is gonna give you the morning sun, and then it's gonna go over the house midday, and you're not gonna get much sun the rest of the day. And then north is probably the worst. North is gonna be very, very shady, and you're not gonna have a lot of success growing citrus in there. Now, again, this might determine how you're gonna grow your citrus plant. If you wanna try and grow it year round in your house, you definitely want a south facing window, a room that has a south facing window. Maybe a west facing window might give you enough sunlight, especially if there's no trees outside blocking the sunlight coming in. Uh, difficult to kind of determine that right now because there's not a lot of leaves on the trees. So if you've got a tree out there and you know, hey, in the summer, this room actually doesn't get that much light, then you might consider a different room or what it might determine is how you're gonna grow it, which means you might grow your, your citrus tree inside your house during the you know, late fall, mid fall, all the way through the winter into spring and then spring, summer into early fall, you can take it outside. And so a lot of that does kind of determine, light, light determines maybe how you're gonna grow your plant. Uh, but light is very important. You wanna give it as much light as you possibly can. Now, let me go and take this just a little bit step, a step further and say, if you're gonna be taking your plants outside for a summer vacation to give it some, some natural light and some airflow, um, then what you can do uh, or what you want to do is take your plant when it's coming from the indoor space, even if it's a south facing window and you're like, you know, my plant's not doing real well, I'm gonna give it a summer vacation this year. Um, then when you take it outside, don't take it straight to full sun area. Take it to an area where it gets a little bit of shade. Uh, I like to put them underneath a tree. The east side of a home is fine. Uh, somewhere where you're gonna get a little bit of shade. If you don't have a lot of shade, maybe an umbrella, maybe some sort of cloth fabric over, uh, canopy that you can build over it, just to give it a little bit of shade because going from an indoor space, even a very, very bright indoor space, to full sun is going to probably burn your plant a little bit. It's just not used to that. And so we've gotta acclimate it. So for about a week, I usually let it sit in a morning sun afternoon shade area then i'll take it for another week into an area where maybe it gets a little bit more afternoon sun and then i can finally move it to a full sun area however i will say outside you really are okay with about six to eight hours of sunlight indoors you would love to get the eight to ten hours of sunlight um, but light is very important and that determines a lot about how we're going to grow uh, and, and where we're going to grow it in our homes or outside of our homes but that's an important tip. Make sure to take it to a little bit of a shady location, acclimate it to full sun. And then when you bring it back in, I even might consider doing that. I might take it to a little bit of a shadier location. Usually by the time we're taking it back indoors, um, you're getting a little bit less light. The days are a little bit shorter and that, and that thing. Um, so you're not gonna have major, major issues coming back indoors. All right, so that's light. Light is important. Um, the next thing is where you're gonna, or what you're gonna grow it in. And this is the cool thing, is you can really grow citrus in a lot of different types of containers. You don't have to worry about it too much. However, I will say, if you consider plant, uh, moving it inside and outside, you, the, the type of container might uh, be important to you um, because of the weight. So you can grow citrus in plastic pots, you know, just a lightweight plastic pot. You can grow them in, Terracotta. Terracotta is a great option, that kind of Tuscany kind of look, that very kind of, I love terracotta with citrus. It just kind of seems to marry very well. Um, but terracotta is a great option, not as heavy either. Then of course you can go to the heavier one, which is the ceramic pot. So if you're growing it indoors and maybe you found the perfect spot and you know it's gonna stay there for a long time, you might consider growing it in a nice ceramic pot. 
Um, the third or fourth option, sorry, the fourth option is just to use a nice ceramic pot as a as, as your kind of saucer as well. So this one uh, does have a drain hole, but it's actually got a plug in it. So you can see right there, there's, there's a plug in the bottom. And this is just a nice decorative pot and I can use this as my saucer. So I can take, I've got a lime right here. I'm gonna show you some of these a little bit later. But I can just sit this in there and that can be my container. And so I can grow it in there, even though I'm just growing it in a plastic pot. And you might do that for years and years and years. Um, and when you need to upgrade, we're gonna talk about repotting here in a second, but when you need to upgrade your pot and when you need to repot it, you can just plant it into another plastic pot and then slip it into a nice ceramic planter as basically a covering, a pot cover, um, and also can act as your saucer a little bit. So when you go to water it, this will collect the water and then you can go dump it out. We'll talk about watering as well, but I just wanna talk about containers first. And so there's lots and lots of different options. Uh, one thing that I will recommend is when you buy a citrus plant at first, try not to change a whole lot of things. And I kind of make this a general rule of thumb whenever I'm growing any indoor plant, whether it's a fern or Dracaena, um, you know, all, all of those different plants, and theriums, I mean, the plants go on and on. But whenever I get a plant that's growing in a greenhouse here at the garden center, and I take it home, I typically leave it in that plastic pot for a little while, at least three to four weeks. Give it some time to get acclimated to its new home. Don't throw anything else at it. If you have to repot it, that's fine. Um, but uh, I, I do recommend keeping it in that plastic pot if you can for a little bit of time, just to let it get acclimated, you know, get used to its new home uh, so that you're not adding another stressor to it. So you, know, you don't need to take it home and dump a bunch of fertilizer in it, repot it, do all these things, prune it, all these things you know, are gonna be a little bit of a stress to it. So just let it get acclimated. It's gonna do a lot better, I think, for you if you do that. All right, so those are all the different types of containers. I uh, do think again about where you're gonna grow it. Now, let me say this as we go into our repotting portion of this, uh, when to repot is kind of important, um, but also the size of your container is very important. Uh, and the timing is important. So this is where it gets a little confusing. You know, try and think what's best for the plant. That's what I always do is I try and say to myself, if, if I were this plant, how would I wanna be treated right now? And so let's talk about size of pots because this is important. If I've got, this is a, I would say a one gallon container size, let's say maybe an eight to 10 inch size, uh, somewhere in that range, maybe, maybe six inch diameter, but about eight inches tall. So this is a normal kind of you know, size container. And I can also check it with my finger. It feels really loose on the top. I feel lots of soil down in there. So it probably doesn't need to be repotted. But let's say it did. You would have a lot of roots. It would be very stiff. Like down here, I can push in the side. It's nice and easy to push in. So I know there's not a ton of roots in here, so I don't need to repot this one. But if I were, then I wouldn't want to grade up to a big pot. So I wouldn't want to go from this one. Let's see if you can see the diameter. See how big that pot is compared to this size pot? That's important is not to go into a big pot because what'll happen is the soil that remains around that repotted citrus plant, any plant, um, is not gonna dry out very easily. So you're gonna have a lot of issues where the soil is gonna stay very moist. There's not a lot of root system. We don't, indoors, we don't have what? We don't have evaporation as quickly. We don't have wind. We don't have as much sunlight as we're gonna get outside. So you're gonna have issues with plants um, uh, staying too wet too long because there's nothing to absorb that moisture. So that moisture is just sitting around in that excess potting soil and there's nothing to, to kind of help eliminate some of that. The plant's not big enough to use it all and we don't have the other environmental factors that we do outside. So it's important to grade up gradually. And so what I mean by that is something like this plastic pot. I'll use this one as an example. So you can see right there, I could slip it in there obviously, but um, I've got about one to two inches of excess soil that I'm gonna to have to put around this plant. So that's, that's about what you want. Maybe three inches, that might be pushing it a little bit, but you typically wanna grade up about one to two inches so you're not adding a lot of excess soil. Now timing also comes into play here. So we wanna make sure that we're going into a season, spring, summer, that is going to give us a little bit more ability to control the, uh, the, the amount of moisture in the soil. And what I mean by that is you're gonna get more root growth, you're gonna get more top growth, it's gonna need more moisture in the spring and summer time frame than it is in the fall and winter. The fall and winter, as it starts to slow down, um, it's not gonna be growing as aggressively. Plus you don't have the option of saying, I, I might have messed up. I think I put too much soil in here, or it doesn't seem to be drying out. If you do it in the spring and summer, you have the option of being able to take it out 
And, and if you can take it outside, then that's very, very important uh, that you can take it outside and let it dry out a, a little bit quicker. Another important thing is making sure that your pot has drain holes. Uh, you want the water to drain out. So as I mentioned this pot earlier, the ceramic pot that has a plug in it, now I could take that plug out and I, I would have a drain hole. But this, pl this planter is really designed to be kind of, an, uh, to have inserts, to have a plant just inserted into it. If you wanted to plant in it, yes, you could. You can plant in anything. And if you've got a specific pot that you want to plant something in and doesn't have a drain hole, come and talk to us. Let us see if we can help you figure out how, if you can do the charcoal and the rock. That's difficult, especially if you can't see through the container and see how much moisture is down the bottom. We don't want to run into any of those issues. So I always recommend if you know that you're going to plant your citrus plant, any indoor plant, into a pot that doesn't have a drain hole, you should probably pick one that does. It makes life so much easier. Uh, but these pots are great because I can grow it in a plastic pot and just in insert it. So again, always have lots and lots of options for you as well. Now, the soil is also important, making sure that you're using the right type of potting soil. Always get a very high-end professional blend of potting soil. Our McDonald potting soils here, we have an all-purpose and a natural and organic. Uh, there's two kind of main soils out there, and that's pretty much what they are, either all-purpose or natural and organic. And really the only difference, especially in our soils that we have made specifically for the Hampton Roads area, they're very professional, they're very high end. The natural and organic tends to stay a little bit moister. And that's because we use a wetting agent in it that's derived from uh, yucca, from a yucca extract. And what that does is it tends to hold a little bit more water. So I love the natural and organic for outdoor plants, for growing anything in containers. If you're gonna be taking your citrus outdoor in the summer, uh, outdoors into the summer time frame then that would be a very, very good potting soil. If you think you're gonna try and get it to grow inside year round, then I would recommend the all-purpose potting soil. It just tends to dry out a little bit better. And the only difference there is it's got a man-made wetting agent in it. It's not toxic, doesn't hurt anything, doesn't get absorbed by the plant. It just helps so that you don't get a cake ball. And that's what the yucca extract does, and that's what a wetting agent does, is it basically prevents your soil from becoming a brick that is very difficult to water. Um, so that's what a wetting agent is. Um, other than that, they're pretty simple and they're pretty basic and they're pretty similar. Some people actually might recommend a cactus soil because it's really, really well drained, um, especially if you're gonna be growing it indoors year round. So a cactus soil, we also carry those and you can get those pretty much anywhere. Uh, cactus soil will, will be very well drained, might not hold as much moisture, maybe you're not as good at watering. We're gonna talk about watering here in a second, but it's important to use a good potting soil, make sure that your pot has drain holes and make sure that you're grading up gradually and then timing is very important. Make sure that you're water, or make sure that you're repotting your citrus plant, any indoor plant, as we go into the spring and summer, if you can. If it's very, very root bound, and you, and you don't think you can make it through to, uh, the the fall winter time frame, check with us. I think you probably can. It's usually better to let an indoor plant be root bound rather than repotting it, having excess soil that it can't expel that that extra water because it doesn't need it. Doesn't you need, need to use it. Um, and then again, because you can do it in the spring and fall or the spring and summer, you have the ability to take it outside if we've done something wrong and we need to correct it. Uh, outside, it's going to dry out a lot better. So that's kind of my repotting part, talking about containers, soil. Uh, we've talked about light. Um, and then we're going to talk about uh, watering. So let's talk about watering for, for a second. Uh, it's not too, too bad. What I always tell people with indoor watering is try not to get on a schedule. Try not to water all your plants at one, on one day. Uh, I know that seems easier and that might be easier, and I realize that, but all plants use water at a different uh, intervals. All plants like different amounts of water. Um, you probably hear me a lot of times, if you've ever watched any of my webinars, uh, say with indoor plants, do a wet dry cycle. And that is kind of the general rule of thumb. With citrus, you're gonna wanna water when the top two to three inches are dry. You don't wanna let it go completely dry. So a lot of times I'll tell you that it get really dry, and then water it really well, and then let it go really dry, and that's called a wet dry cycle. With citrus, you're actually gonna wanna let it dry out slightly, but not get overly dry, because you can start to get leaf damage and you can start to uh, decrease the production of your yield, your crop, your citrus, your, your li limes and lemons. Um, so we wanna make sure we're keeping it evenly moist, but letting it dry out slightly, but not to the point of where the soil starts to wick away from the pot. That would be the worst. Um, so make sure that you're keeping your plants adequately watered. Overwatering is probably the number one cause for anybody not being successful with indoor plants. So I stress to you, water it well, let it get drier, and don't get on a watering schedule because that can severely impact your plants. While some plants might love it, not all plants want the same amount of water at the same day 
Um, typically watering uh, citrus plants. We're gonna water more in the spring and summer when it's actively growing and producing that fruit and making it get larger. As we get into the fall and winter time frame, we're gonna not be watering as much. Our house is cooled down. Um, and so we don't have as much sunlight. The sun is not out as much. Uh, so you're not gonna water as much indoors. And, and it's hard for me to say how much you're gonna water in a, in a time frame. I will typically say if you're watering three or four times in the winter in a month, that's probably too much. Um, you're probably gonna be somewhere around one to two times a month watering. Um, now, if it's very, very root bound, might be a little bit more. If it's near a vent where you're getting some heat, uh, if it's near a drafty area where maybe it's uh, getting uh, some wind and it's drying out, maybe your house just doesn't have as much humidity and it's, and it's drying out, then that could also be a cause. Um, or, or a cause to need to water a little bit more. So you kind of have to play it by, I, I can't give you an exact like, water it once a week. That's, that's not how it's gonna work inside because inside everything's different. Every, everybody's home is different. Everybody has their temperature set differently um, and every room can have different types of levels of humidity. So it's very important to just kind of be, you know, have a rule of thumb there that say, let the top two to three inches um, that, uh, of the soil get um, dry before we water it again. And I've got a little helpful thing for you here. This is a great little moisture meter. We have these in stock now. They were hard to get last year. I know we ran out, but we do have them in stock now. Uh, but this is an awesome little moisture meter. It's also a pH and a light meter. So for this, for citrus, this does everything that you need. And it really gives you a helpful kind of guide. Now, is it specific? Is it super, super accurate? No. Uh, but it's pretty good. I mean, it'll tell you your light. So it's got a little switch down here. You can go to moisture, you can go to light, and you can go to pH. Um, what you want to protect are these um, uh, sensors here on these, um, on these rods that you're going to insert down into the soil. Make sure to clean them with a wet washcloth or something afterwards. A wet paper towel is really nice. Something gentle that's not going to uh, uh, you know, cause too much abrasion on these. That's what usually causes these to malfunction is you put them down in a very hard, compact soil, especially outside if it's got gravel, it starts to scratch these up and then the sensors start to go. So be a little bit careful with it. Great for indoor plants. I love it for the light and moisture. pH is gonna get you in a general range, but pH isn't super important. And I'll mention that real quick. pH for citrus is anywhere between a 5.5 to a 6.5, maybe even a seven is okay. We don't want it to be too acidic, uh, which would be in your 4.5. If we're growing them in pots, which you have to do in this area, most potting soils are gonna be pretty neutral in that uh, six to seven range. And so you're probably gonna be okay. You probably don't need to watch it too much. But if you're having issues and you've got this guy, you can check the soil pH and make sure you're in that right range. Make sure you haven't dropped or, or gone too high for some reason. Maybe we've been adding uh, a fertilizer or something, a plant food or any kind of other amendments that maybe have, have brought that pH down. Peat moss is used in a lot of potting soil, helps keep that pH up a little bit and not bring it down too, too low. Uh, but this is a great thing. It also helps you with your moisture. So if you're just not very good, I, I still feel like this is the best tool you got right here is your finger. Check your soil. If it's dry on the top two to three inches water, but a moisture meter will help you as well. It'll grade you from, let's see, I think it does a dry to a wet. So you put this in there, you turn it to the moisture setting and it'll tell you what you got. It also helps you with your light. So if you're concerned about your light, it'll help you with that. It's a great little tool to have, especially for beginners out there that are doing indoor plants. It's a really, really, it's a kind of a must have, but I even use mine at home every once in a while, just because I'm not sure. It's like this plant, I just watered it the other day. There's no way it's dry. Um, let's see if what the meter tells me. It just might help. It always gives you a little bit of a crutch to kind of lean on to say, I've got an, another little tool to help. $14.99 not bad price for something that checks three different very key things for you light moisture and ph okay so that helps with the, the watering part um let's see a couple other tips here that i've written down for watering um, of course outdoors when you take your citrus outdoors then you might be watering more we're going to have uh, more wind we're going to have uh, more sun as we especially as we acclimate it to the full sun area so you might be watering every other day to every day depending on the time of the year just watch it again you can check it with your moisture meter check it with your finger you can also use weight weight is a great way to check if a plant is dry you know water really well when it's dry or when the top two to three inches are dry water really well and then just feel the weight of it 
and say, okay, now I know what it feels like when it's very well watered. And then I can pick it up later and say, okay, it's a little bit drier. Maybe, you know, check it with your finger, use your moisture meter. Um, and then when it gets really dry, you'll really know what it feels like because it'll be much, much lighter. It's a great way to water hanging baskets as well um, by weight because they're hanging already and you can just kind of push up on them and say, okay, it's still got some weight in it, so I don't need to water it as much. It makes your day go much faster when you just go out there and pick it up real quick and check the weight. Now, as we get into ceramic pots or bigger pots, it might not be as easy to feel the weight of it, uh, but a, a wet soil is always going to weigh a lot more than a dry soil. So weight helps. Also with water indoors, this is my favorite kind of tip. Uh, is to let your water sit for 24 hours if you can. Fill up your watering can, let it sit for 24 hours. That really helps get some of those things that we have to put in there as humans uh, to make it drink safe for us, uh, like fluoride and different types of, uh, of additives that we put in there. And we don't want to add those into our, our plants if we can at all um, um, help it. Rainwater is obviously amazing. It's nature's gift. So if you can get a rain barrel, collect rainwater, your indoor plants are going to absolutely love it. They're going to thrive. Um, but if you can't do that or you don't want to, that's fine too. Just let your tap water sit for about 24 hours. And this is my tip is if you say, oh, I got a water, but I forgot to let my water set up for 24 hours. Trust me, your plants will make it one more day. It's a great thing. I always, I, phones are, are so helpful these days. And so what I'll do is I'll say, ah, I forgot to put water out. I always do it. I almost do it every single time I water. Um, and I say, man, I forgot to let my water sit out for 24 hours. So. I'll go fill up my watering can right then and there as I'm thinking about it, let it sit and I'll set my phone, I'll just set a reminder telling me to water tomorrow so I don't forget to water. I let my water sit out for 24 hours and I'm ready to roll. The other tip is when you're done watering, fill up your watering can and let it sit because the next time you need to water, you'll already have it ready. So just a couple tips there. It does help to kind of let it sit for a little bit. Some of those uh, additives that we put in there do evaporate out. Uh, so that does help. All right, now let's talk about um, uh, feeding our citrus. So we're going to talk about uh, uh, what kind of different additives we need to add for food uh, to feed our plants. Um, and there's lots and lots of different options out there. Uh, and we realize that. But one of my favorites, of course, is our own, our McDonald green leaf. This is, we've got a traditional formula and we've got our organic formula. So these are great options. Uh, we've got our traditional formula is really nice. It's a little bit stronger. It's a 1248. Uh, what's great about both of these, this is our organic, it's an A24. But what I love about our fertilizers that we design for this area is they have trace elements. And trace elements are super important, especially when growing citrus or food, uh, whether it's vegetables, herbs, uh, fruit trees, any of those citrus plants. They love having some of these micronutrients, and that's boron and copper and zinc and iron. Iron is very, very important. I'll talk about that in a minute, but iron is a great one. And these both have sources of iron in them. So it's a very, very good all purpose, but it's great for citrus plants. Now, if we want to get a little bit more specific and we love to support uh, any kind of uh, 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 citrus plant or any kind of plant you want to grow, uh, we do love our Espoma organic plant foods. So these are a great one. This is a citrus tone. And so again, it's got all of those things in it. It's got nitrogen, potassium, and phosphorus, our macronutrients, but it's also got trace elements. So it's got calcium and magnesium and sulfur, but you will see there's no iron in this. And so I love citrus tone. It's a great one. It, it, it's, it's a very light formula. The nice thing about citrus tone, um, it's a five, two, six, um, is that you can accidentally mess up. You can actually dump too much on there and you're not going to hurt it. Uh, and it's citrus tone is designed specifically for citrus. So it's a great one. I love our green leaf. I love citrus tone. I love them all. So whatever you want to use, it's up to you. If I had to recommend, I'm going to recommend our McDonald green leaf because I feel like it's a little bit better. Um, but our Espoma citrus tone is a great option as well. There's also a fourth one. And that's our happy frog. So happy frog citrus and avocado food, a little bit stronger. It's a 733. Um, let's see the trace elements in here are iron, sulfur, magnesium, and calcium. So again, another good formulation. It's personal preference. You know, sometimes you might try a different one and see which one you, you uh, seem to think thrives a little bit better in. But the reason that I love our green leaf is it's got a nice strong uh, dose of iron in it as well as calcium and boron and zinc and all of those great uh, uh, micronutrients that you don't uh, see in a lot of big fertilizers these days. So if you use Osmocote, miracle Row, I'm not going to say they're bad, but they're giving you those macronutrients. You need micronutrients as well. You need some of those small things. So I mentioned iron. 
Iron is very, very important. Uh, citrus plants use a lot of them. And so if you've ever grown a citrus and you've seen that your leaves are starting to yellow, and I wish I had an, uh, uh, an example. I guess the good news is I don't uh, because all of our plants look very, very healthy. Uh, let's see, this one that's, sometimes you'll see it when they're blooming very heavily, and that is pretty natural. And I don't think you're gonna be able to see it too much on this leaf, but you can see how it's a, sorry, the focus. See how it's a little bit off green. It's not quite as dark as all these other leaves behind us. And you can start to see a little bit of yellowing. And so what a iron deficient leaf is going to show you is green veins and yellowing on the inside of the leaf. And by the veins, I mean that kind of main vein that comes up to the center of the leaf, and then it branches off in different segments. Uh, and you're gonna see, you see the back of it, you might be able to even see the veins there. But you're gonna see that, that leaf starting to yellow a little bit. This is a very, very small sign of it. It's just a slightly off green, but that means it could be coming. And so what we wanna do is we wanna treat with a iron supplement. And, and I recommend doing this regardless of how much iron might be in your plant food. Uh, because when the leaves start to turn yellow, it's very difficult to get them back. Um, and so just getting on a regimen of using this, it is awesome. This is a chelated, some people might call it chelated, I guess it's, you know, tomato, tomato, chelated liquid iron. Um, and so this is very easy to use. It's a tablespoon to two tablespoons per gallon of water. Um, you just mix it with your gallon of water and use this every three to four months. I like to say, um, you know, what my houseplant buyer taught me is uh, use it when the seasons change. So as we go into fall, use it. As we go into winter, as we go into spring, and as we go into summer, that'll give you four doses of it this a year. One to two tablespoons, it's gonna go a long way. It's not very expensive. I don't have this one labeled, so I don't know off the top of my head, but I wanna say it's like $7.99. It's not bad, um, and it goes a long way. And you can use it for a lot of different plants. I mean, a lot of plants use iron. So think like fragrant blooms, which I haven't talked about much yet, but I will get to. Uh, fragrant blooms typically use iron or use another uh, um, micronutrient to produce those. Gardenias, another very important one. So if you've got gardenias in your yard, and especially when they're done blooming, you're gonna see the leaves kind of turn yellow. Some of that's natural. It's gotta drop some of them and put a lot of energy into making those blooms. Why do plants bloom? To produce a seed, to reproduce. Hence, how you get lemons and limes. Um, but iron will really, really help take that shock off. So if you're thinking, man, I don't really need that much. This is the smallest bottle it comes in is a 16 ounce concentrate, but it's one to two tablespoons. And trust me, I think you'll find other uses for it because a lot of other plants will thrive with a little bit of iron. If your lawn, if a section of your lawn is starting to turn a little yellow, uh, gardenias, there's lots and lots of different types of plants that would uh, do very well with this. You can also do a foliage spray if you want to. There's directions on it with everything. Always read your directions. It goes a long way as to, to making you successful. It's just by looking at those directions. All right, so uh, let me go back on one other thing that I did miss before we go on to pollination and then my other tips and then we'll talk about some varieties and I saw some questions up there. Um, so uh, let's talk about one other thing, the, the uh, humidity tray, the use of the humidity tray. So humidity is important. Uh, and indoor plants, we're starting to realize more and more that our homes lack humidity. So when we're growing plants inside, you're not gonna get that natural humidity. Now, if you're a big plant, indoor plant guru, uh, and you really wanna add some humidity, you can get a humidifier, but you don't have to. A simple, easy trick, is take a saucer, it could be anything, it could be a plastic terracotta saucer, it could be one of these clear plant, uh, you know, your, your furniture protectors, your saucers, this is kind of a, a little bit of a lightweight plastic, this is a little bit of a stronger plastic, but what you're gonna do is basically take a rock, any kind of rock, it could be pea gravel, it could be pond stone, it could be pebbles, it could be a gray rock, chalet, it could be a lot of different things, but you put a, basically a layer of rock in there that you can flatten out. So I like to use finer rock, helps me a little bit to be able to get a nice flat surface. Uh, put your rock in there and then fill it with a little bit of water and then place your plant on top of it. Now what I don't recommend is just using the saucer with water, put your plant on it, and then you've got this reservoir of water down here. So let's talk about why we use saucers. It's to protect our furniture, um, protect our decks, our patios if you're using them outside, but you don't want these to fill up with water and stay with a lot of water in it. There's a couple plants out there that would love it, ferns, uh, some other type, uh, types of plants that love kind of a boggy uh, situation, but that water is gonna constantly get wicked back up into the soil, and so if you're letting this fill up and stay full, not only can it create issues with too much water, but it can also create mold and mildew and type of different things. So always use it to collect the water, then take your plant, dump this out, 
and then use it again. Now, if you're using it as a humidity tray, that's different because humidity is going to, uh, when you've got the rock in here, that's why we put rock in there, is so that the roots and the soil don't sit on that moisture and it won't wick it up as quickly. Then that, 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 what happens is that water in your saucer is going to evaporate and, and uh, create a humid situation, especially in that little microclimate zone wherever you're growing this plant. So that's a great way of increasing humidity. Now, signs of humidity uh, issues would be leaf loss. So I think I saw a lot of people over there saying my leaves are falling off. Very common with citrus and can happen for lots and lots of different reasons. So one reason is uh, bringing it home for the first time or acclimating it to a new place. Let's say you take it out for a summer vacation, you bring it back in. Sometimes you'll lose leaves when you take it out. Sometimes you'll lose leaves when you come back in. Um, also bringing it from a garden center, from a greenhouse inside your home, you might get some leaf loss, but also low humidity can create a lot of leaf loss. So if you've had your plant for a while and it's starting to lose leaves and you don't know why, try this trick with the saucer, get some rock and fill it up and create a little bit more of a humid situation around the plant. I think you'll see the benefits. What we don't want to do is spray our leaves with a mister. We don't want to mist our leaves of our citrus plants. They can get powdery mildew. As we'll talk about insect and fungus issues here in a minute, but moisture on the leaves of a lot of indoor plants is okay. Uh, in fact, we're starting to learn more and more about this humidity, as I'm mentioning, and misting your plants is a great thing. Just don't do it with citrus because citrus don't love it as much. Certain plants are, certain plants don't. That's why we're here is to help educate you. I don't want to get super, super complicated, but a humidity tray is always going to be safer than misting. So I'll put it that way. Uh, you know, putting a little humidity tray underneath it, a saucer with rock and some water will really, really help your plants, especially citrus that we don't want to mist. So I forgot to mention that. That was in my watering section. I apologize. All right. So what else? Um, oh, and then leaf loss can also occur. So I know we were mentioning leaf loss because of iron deficiency or because of lack of food. Uh, it takes a lot of energy for these plants, for these citrus plants to produce these gorgeous white blooms uh, that are super, super fragrant. And then even as they're starting to fruit, it produces, it takes a long time to, um, or a lot of energy to produce those blooms. And that's why we talked about feeding them so much. Um, and I forgot, I failed to mention this when I was talking about feeding our plants, um, that we wanna do it uh, pretty regularly throughout the year. The only time we kind of take off is as we get into the fall time frame, late into fall, early winter, you might not feed as much because it's not aggressively growing. But it really depends on what the plant's doing. And that's what's cool about citrus is they always seem to be doing something. Whether they're blooming or setting fruit, they need energy in pots. The nutrients are going to run through a potting soil fairly quickly. And so we want to keep on feeding our plants somewhere around uh, every uh, uh, four to six weeks, maybe as much as eight weeks. But usually about six weeks is my kind of bread and butter number um, for indoor, especially potted plants, whether they're outside or inside, nutrients are gonna go through that soil fairly quickly. Um, so that, that really does help. I see a question from Ann about will, will uh, grow lights help for those indoor months, cloudy days? For sure, if your plant is struggling, um, then yes, uh, uh, the, the, the a grow light will definitely help. Um, but finding a sunny window is gonna be your best Thing. And, and if you don't have it, and you don't have a grow light and you don't want to do it, don't worry, spring is coming. So if we can make sure that we can get our plant to the springtime, then we can take it outside, let it revive a little bit, come back to life, and that will really help. I'll throw out one more other tip. Um, and I see Kathy said, do you recommend Job's spikes for citrus? I don't recommend spikes of any kind. In fact, you won't ever see them in our garden center. Um, I, I'm the buyer and I personally don't believe that it's a good idea to put fertilizer, plant feed, uh, into a specific zone around a plant. So a lot, a lot of people wanted to use them for fruit trees um, because uh, it, it, it kind of seemed interesting, I guess. And so I never really believed in them. And the reason is, is because it's feeding a specific zone. Now, yes, it can spread out some, but it's not gonna spread out much. The best way to feed a plant, to, to, to uh, fertilize your plants, is in the drip zone. So in an outdoor plant, that's gonna be kind of where its canopy hangs. So if this plant were in the ground, then my roots would be out here and that's where we want to feed. And so if I put a spike here and a spike here and a spike here, I'm only getting to a fourth, an eighth of the root system. And I really want to get it all the way around. So that's why I love granular fertilizers and plant feed um, because it really, really helps uh, be able to get the food all the way around the plant. In a container, even more important, uh, plant spikes probably work a little bit better in a container, but not much and not as good as a granular plant food. So when I've got something like this and I can take two or three tablespoons and drop it right on the top surface, 
I know that's getting all the way through the entire surface of that root ball um, and getting used completely, which I think is very, very beneficial. So I don't love the spikes. If you want to use them, I'm not going to say that they're bad. I'm sure they are specifically designed for citrus, which is good, but I think a granular plant food is a little bit more evenly fed over top of the root system. Uh, so then the last thing I want to show you is super, or not the last thing, but another thing about talking about feeding plants or issues where we've got a stressed out plant, it's losing leaves, maybe we're having issues, is super thrive. Super thrive when a lot of times when people come into the garden center and they either don't have a plant to show me or don't have pictures and they're trying to describe something and it doesn't, it sounds like they're doing everything right. You're watering right, it's got the right light, you're feeding it, you're doing everything correct, you're pruning, all those, all these good things you're doing. And then it's like, I'm not quite sure what's going on. Doesn't have insect issues, doesn't have a fungus issue. Then Super Thrive is a great option. Seems kind of hokey, I know the package looks kind of hokey, ho hokey but um, it's the 1940 World's Fair Gold Medal winner. Um, but it is awesome. Basically, it's a vitamin supplement for any plant. Um, it works great for plants, tr transplant shock. It just kind of takes the shock off of a plant. I kind of almost call it like steroids for plants. Uh, kind of gets it revived and gets it going again. And so Super Thrive is always a good thing to have around. It goes a long way. I think it's a little eight ounce bottle. Let's see, does it say it? Yeah, eight ounces. And it's basically like a half a tablespoon, a half a teaspoon um, that goes into a gallon of water. So it goes a long way. It's a great thing. It is not a plant food. It does not have all the nutrients, but it's basically a vitamin supplement, kind of steroids for plants, gets them back going again. So if you're having issues and you think you're doing everything right, this might be a good option to kind of see if that takes the shock off your plants and get back. Don't know what happened there. Apologize. Technical difficulties. We've been off for a little bit, so um, I'll let everybody get back in. Uh, hopefully we'll uh, continue this here in a second. I'm going to give everybody a little bit of time to get back into the webinar. I do apologize. We had a little technical issue there. Um, all of a sudden my screen just went blank, so I apologize. Let's see if uh, we can wait a second and let everybody get back in. Um, and then I'll pick up back up. I'm not quite sure where I left off. I think it was around the, the ant question. Uh, so I'll pick back up there and we'll get rolling in just a second. I want to make sure everybody has time to get back in uh, and find us again. I apologize. These technical issues tend to happen from time to time. Um, and we've been gone for, I don't know, a little bit, uh, maybe about a month. Um, so I do apologize. Hello again, Ant. Um, so I'll start by saying if you asked a question and I hadn't gotten to it yet, I was going to get to them at the end. Um, so feel free to ask your question again because I think I've lost all those questions. Um, and if I didn't, I'll go back and look and, 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 and see if uh, when we finish up this webinar, uh, if you have questions and I'll answer them then. Um, so I know I was talking about, I'll, I'll get rolling here again um, and we'll talk about, um, I know somebody had a question about ants and I'm not sure if y'all heard my answer. So. We had ants in the potting soil in an outdoor greenhouse, um, and that is a very common issue with uh, greenhouses and growing plants in general. I know working at a garden center many years, you go to pick up a plant and it's got lots of ants. Uh, ants love to form a nest and a, uh, in a potting soil because it's nice and loose and it's easy to work around. You got lots of moisture, so it's a great little home for them to, 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 to make. And that's most likely what the issue is uh, with your ants. Now, ants can be a cause of something else, which is other insects like aphids and mealybug and scale eating your plants. So you might have another infestation that we need to take care of. Um, and so what I would do is make sure to inspect your plants, if you, especially if you've got ants crawling up into the citrus plant. Um, it's because these insects secrete a substance called honeydew, um, and that attracts ants. Um, but most likely it's just because it's a warm place, it's in a greenhouse, and it's got a really nice soft potting soil that gets lots of water. Uh, so that really does help. Um, so what I would do is wait till the spring, and then I would wash off all that old potting soil, knock out the ants, take out your plant to an, an area where you don't mind the ants being, wash off all the potting soil nice and gently. Uh, you don't need to take it down to a bare root, and then add a uh, nice fresh potting soil back in, and then take it back into your greenhouse or start growing it outside. Um, and that will really help. Uh, I see Deborah has a question about how large will it get. Really depends on the plant, depends on the pot. Um, all, all indoor plants are gonna grow at a much slower rate than they would outside in the ground. Um, and so especially doing you know, our growing season, which means what I mean by that is you know, citrus grows down in Florida, obviously, and, and they have like 365 days of growing almost. Uh, so there's not a whole lot of time where those plants couldn't be growing, so they have all that time to grow. Here, 
being inside and outside or just being inside, depending on how you grow it, uh, was going to slow down the growth rate for sure. Um, they are pretty fast growing. I think if you've ever grown a citrus plant, you'll see lots of shoots of growth. I have, uh, this one is a great example. Look at that little shoot of growth coming off the side there. So that's all pretty much new growth. And uh, within, you know, this past year probably. So they can actually grow fairly quickly. I'm going to talk about pruning here in a little bit. Uh, that will help kind of maintain your plant size. Um, but if your plant's starting to grow and it's getting bigger and you want it to get bigger, put it into a bigger pot. Keep grading up as we grow um, and, and let them get as big as you possibly can let it get. Now we can prune pretty aggressively too, especially if we get bigger. We'll talk about pruning here in a second. Uh, but I think I answered the ant question. Let's see, I've got, uh, Michael says, I have uh, Magic Cow, uh, which has all three calcium, or I've got Cow Mag, which has all three calcium, magnesium, and iron in it. Would that be a good supplement in my watering to my new Meyer lemon bush I have? Uh, it's indoors for now until spring. I used it on peppers before with good results. Yeah, all three of those nutrients are great things. Calcium, magnesium, and iron, they're all very good. Uh, it's what citrus and really any plant, uh, food producing plant is gonna want, um, as you saw with your peppers. Uh, so yes, definitely use that. Not a problem at all. Specifically with citrus, it's typically iron, and that's why I mentioned it. Um, but that'll definitely work. All right, so, and then Beth said, uh, leaves falling off also should... Uh, you expect the production of lemons or does it vary? Uh, what should you should, uh, expect for production? Um, so lemons are, are tricky. Beth, I'm gonna save that question for just a little bit as I get into varieties maybe, um, or as we get into the pollination part um, and, and pruning and all that, we'll start to talk about. And so I, what I, I think I mentioned maybe before, but maybe while our video went out there, um, was uh, you know citrus can take a little bit of time. They're typically going to bloom in the spring, and then they're going to uh, uh, set fruit throughout the summer time frame, and then the fruit will ripen in the in the fall and winter. Typically, that's not 100%. Uh, you know, all plants kind of can do different things. Some plants will actually produce flowers throughout the season and keep producing fruit, so you kind of have like uh, a production of fruit throughout the year, uh, different harvest timing uh, times. But most plants are typically going to be on that schedule. They're going to start blooming pretty soon. Uh, let's see if I can show you an example. Here's a great example. So you can see all these little buds right here just starting. So you might be seeing that starting to form on your citrus pretty soon. Now, of course, ours are in a greenhouse, so that might not have happened yet for you. But a lot of times they're going to bloom in the spring. You'll start by seeing these buds, and then they'll start to set fruit. And it takes a long time to get that fruit to ripe. Uh, so be patient. That is probably one of my best uh, tips for advice on citrus is be patient uh, because it can take some time and it seems like they're sitting on there forever. Uh, but be patient. And then my hope is, I mean, especially like the Meyer lemon, one of my favorite lemons. Uh, it's a very, very good one. We'll talk about that in a minute. But that one kind of produces throughout the year. You get blooms at different times. You get different sets of fruit. So you can kind of always go to your lemon tree and pick uh, fruit. Now, as Deborah mentioned, how large we'll get, the bigger the plant that you have, the more production you're going to get for sure. Um, I know um, uh, uh, the, the former owner here at McDonald Garden Center, he grows citrus in his garage, um, opens up the window, can take him outside during the, the, the summer, the spring and summer, uh, sorry, opens up the garage door. He'll take him out during the spring and summer into fall, but then as it starts to get cooler, he'll bring him into the garage. Garages don't typically get that cold, so you can put them on a caster or something that allows you to move bigger pots easier. Um, that is probably the only difficult thing here with citrus is as they get bigger, how do you move them around? And that's why I always say, if you find a great spot in your home and it's doing really well and it's producing and it's healthy looking, why change it? Um, the only reason that I would take it outside is because either I don't have enough sunlight and that's the way I just gotta grow it, um, or because it's starting to kind of stress or I did something like I put too much potting soil in there. So hopefully that helps with some of those questions. Let's talk about pollination. So if our plants start to bloom, I grabbed this one because it's got a gorgeous bloom open. This is a, uh, a bear's lemon. So when we talk about varieties, if I have time, I'll mention this. But let's say you've got a plant like this and it's blooming inside. Now I don't have a lot of other flowers open, you can see, but they're starting to open pretty soon. All citrus is self-pollinating for the most part. For the most part, they're all gonna self-pollinate. But what that means, it doesn't mean that another one won't help, it will help. But what that also means is this pollen from this flower needs to get to this flower. So let's see, do I have another one? This one, I'm gonna take this big guy out and show you this. It's got a little bit more blooms there that I can show you. So if I've got this plant, 
and this is in my home, and it's starting to do this, and I don't have nature to help me pollinate these blooms. And what I mean is, this one will set fruit by itself. It doesn't need, it, what it needs, it doesn't need another plant. It just needs another pollen from another bloom. And so what I need to do is get pollen from this bloom to this bloom to this bloom to this bloom. And so a little light shake, like wind is an, a very good natural pollinator, but just a little light shake can kind of help move some pollen around. But since we don't have wind inside our home, what you can use is a Q-tip or a paintbrush, a, a, like a watercolor paintbrush, and just dab it in each flower. I think that's a great tip. What you're doing is what the, the bees and the butterflies would be doing outside, but inside we don't have them. And so, and there's lots of other insects that are great pollinators, but the bees and the, but butterflies are the ones we think of the most. Since we don't have those inside our home, then a watercolor paintbrush, a small paintbrush, or a Q-tip will actually serve the same purpose. So it's a great tip. If they're blooming, it's inside, you're gonna take it outside, but the blooms will be done by then, and you need to get pollen moved around. A light shake can help, but it's not gonna be as good as a Q-tip or a paintbrush. So hopefully that helps. It's a great little trick that I've learned that really goes a long way. Uh, what's amazing is when these plants are blooming, how fragrant they are. Um, this is a, that, that bear's lime. Oh, I mean, it's just an amazing fragrance. So even if you're just growing it, just for the enjoyment of growing it, maybe you get some, maybe you don't, you'll love the fragrance of these blooms. They're absolutely stunning, absolutely amazing. Um, so that's what you, can, what you can do with pollination. Now, if it's blooming outside, you don't need to worry about it. The nature will take care of it. There'll be insects and, and, and wind and, and bees and butterflies that will help pollinate the blooms. They are attracted to the pollen and they'll move it from flower to flower. Um, so that's what will help with your, your pollination. All right, a couple other tips that I want to mention because I think I've gone through everything that I really wanted to touch on. We talked about light. We talked about sunlight and how important that is. Uh, and, I, and I think I answered the question on the grow light. We'll be doing a whole thing on grow lights. Uh, so I definitely recommend tuning in for that if you're interested in it where I can get a little bit more in-depth into that. Grow lights do help. So if you're bringing it in for a winter uh, vacation inside, if, if, you, if you take it inside and outside and you're bringing it in during the fall and winter, um, and you have a dark room, then a grow light might be a great option for you. Um, we talked about containers, the different types of containers. We talked about soil and repotting. We talked about all the, all the feeding of your plants and when to feed and all of that. Um, and then watering, we talked about pruning is the next thing that I want to talk about before I get into my final tips. We talked about pollination. So pruning, we don't have to do a whole lot of pruning. Um, I mentioned earlier that you can do a lot of different things with shaping these. So like I'll use this one for example again, if I wanted to really form a tree and kind of get that kind of citrus tree look, then I would keep limiting this up. As you can see, the lower leaves on this have been kind of eliminated and so it's growing from the top and that's going to force more growth up to the top. But you can also grow them shrubby. So I mean this is my ponderosa lemon and you can see how bushy that is, really nice and bushy and full. So you can grow it that way. That calamundum that it's right sitting next to me, I showed you earlier. That one's really, really bushy. Uh, let's see if I've got another example here. So this is a great example of, of kind of a tree slash bush. I could turn this into a tree. I could eliminate some of these lower branches. So by pruning, you can shape it into anything you want. If it's getting too big, so Deborah, if it's getting way too big for you, we can do a nice shaping prune. When do you want to prune is a great question. Uh, so when you want to prune, is usually when it's done with its big harvest. So if you're getting a big crop in that uh, uh, late winter time frame, and you're starting to pick your fruit and you're starting to enjoy it, your citrus, uh, then prune it when you're done because all of those cuts will help it fill back out. A lot of times citrus will get long shoots of growth um, and you wanna make sure uh, that we don't get weak branching. And what that means is if you prune something, every plant grows from a terminal bud. It's gonna grow, it's gonna send out a couple little branches here and there. Uh, but if we take that, that uh, terminal bud off, that, that main growth, and we take that off and we produce, what we're going to do is create uh, the opportunity for that plant to branch out and be more aggressive. Plus, what you've pruned off was going to be called what, what I call weak wood. It's going to be much more flimsy. So, for example, this little lime right here. So, this branch right here, if I got a fruit out here, this is going to break off. There's just no way that this can support that. So because it's not blooming, there's no fruit on it, it's a great time to go ahead and prune it. I can take it and prune it back here. So I'm gonna show you how to do that. It's very, very simple, very easy. And what I'll also mention um, is 
with any type of citrus plant, almost most of them have thorns, so be careful. There are some that are thornless, but just be careful. I don't know if you can quite see that. I'll, when I prune this off, I'll show you the thorns, but they're kind of hidden in there, and if you go in and, and reach in there to grab a, a, a lemon or lime off and you get pricked, uh, don't say I didn't warn you. So, so here I've got this long shoot of growth. It's, if I get blooms on the end of this, which is typically where I'm gonna get blooms from, uh, it's gonna weigh it down too much and it could snap the branch. So to eliminate that, I wanna create a stronger branch and I wanna create a fuller habit too. So I'm gonna take this back. I always say go a little bit further than you thought you might initially go. So what I would probably initially say is go here. So you can see that about halfway, but I'm gonna go one more leaf node back and then I'm gonna cut it at a 45 degree angle as I always do with all my prunes. Um, and then I've got this nice strong piece of growth here that's gonna produce more growth and I'm gonna get a much stronger branch. And what you would do, and what this is called is kind of tipping, what I always call tipping. So I've got another shoot here. I'm gonna take that 45 degree angle, prune that back. I got another shoot of growth over here. If you can see it, how weak that could be if I let it go. So I'm gonna say I probably would go here. So I'm gonna go here, back one more, 45 degree angle. And so what that's called is tipping. You just go around and you're just taking those branches, tipping it back. That's gonna create a much stronger plant. And then the other thing to look for is rubbing branches. So of course, rubbing branches are where branches are kind of connected and they're starting to rub, especially when you move them. So if you've got crossing branches that are separated, you don't need to worry about it. But if you've got crossing branches that are touching, you need to eliminate one and then you just pick the one that you want to eliminate um, and take it back all the way to its stem. The other thing that I'll mention with pruning, this is my last thing on pruning, is most of your uh, uh, citrus trees are gonna be grafted. So let's see if I can find a good example here in one of these that I grabbed. Mm, this one looks like it's got a pretty visible graft point down here. So let's see if I can show you. But down here at the base, you're gonna see kind of right here at the really pretty close to the soil is its graft point. And what they do is they take the desirable citrus. So this is a Meyer lemon. They take the Meyer lemon cutting from a tree and they graft it onto a wild citrus rootstock. And what that's gonna do is produce a very, very vigorous root system because it's wild and it's, it's aggressive and that means it's good and it's strong and it's healthy. Um, and then they're gonna take the desirable citrus and graft it onto it. What that does is typically you're gonna see a, and I don't know that I see any really, really noticeably visible graft point, but if you get a shoot of growth, let's see if I can put this here. If you get a shoot of growth that's coming from below the soil level or just at the base of the plant and it's vigorous and it's growing really fast, that is from the wild citrus plant. So we don't wanna use that. Uh, it's not gonna produce anything. Um, if it ever does produce, it's gonna take away energy from the desirable plant. So any kind of shoots that come from below the graft, make sure to prune off and you'll notice them because they'll come up real fast and real wild and they can take a lot of energy away from your desirable citrus. So other than that, you really don't have to prune them too much. Uh, pruning, like I said, just in increases the vigor and the strength of those branches to support nice big plants. So Kathy says, you mentioned too much potting soil. Uh oh, I just repotted mine. They had been in the same pot for years and were tipping over. How do I know I use too much potting soil? Mine are huge and I move mine back and forth in the garage. Great, Kathy. I just mentioned the garage technique. That's a great option. Uh, the good news is you're close to the outdoor space. We're also close to spring, so I think you're okay. If your plants still seem to be doing okay, that's fine. And if they were severely root bound, I won't say severely, but let's say they were very, very root bound, I think you're gonna be okay going forward. Um, what I generally say, Kathy, is no more than two to three inches of soil all the way around. So for example, now I got my saucer stuck. All right, so in this pot, if I take this one and plant it in there, I've got about a two or three inch space. I don't know if you can quite see that. About a two to three inch space there all the way around, and that's about as much as I want. I could go a little bit more, but I wouldn't be real, real uh, happy about that, especially if you're bringing it in and out. Now, the nice thing, Kathy, is because you've got them in the garage and they're big, uh, I don't think you're gonna have any major issues. Uh, what I would do is when you get a nice warm day, like maybe even today, I think it's supposed to get to 55 today, uh, is you can take it outside. And what you're also gonna wanna do, Kathy, is just make sure to watch your watering. Uh, that excess potting soil that you put in there, it's okay. It's gonna be great come the spring and summertime frame. It's gonna really give it a lot of space to grow and you're not gonna have to water as much and all these good things. So you, you're actually okay, Kathy. Uh, but uh, what you wanna do is just make sure you can get it through the next you know, two months until uh, we can really kind of start to acclimate it back outside. 
Um, I, I'll mention that too because that, that kind of rang a bell in my head uh, when to bring it in and out. Uh, great thing to remember is our frost dates here. Our frost dates are easy ones. Uh, we're lucky. We got easy ones April 15th, tax day, and November 15th, election day. So, uh, or it's around election day, very close. So those two dates are very easy to remember. Um, if we're getting close to, oh, I gotta get my taxes done, uh, that means it's, a, it's getting close to the point where we shouldn't have a, another frost. Uh, and November 15th, election day, oh, we got local elections, we got big elections, whatever elections might be going on, uh, then you can say, oh, that means our first frost is about to come. So kind of keep those in mind. Temperature-wise, citrus isn't gonna like it below 40 degrees, Evenly, they love to be at 65 to 70 degrees, which means if you can get them in the right spot in your home, that's typically our temperatures in our home, they should do very, very well with that temperature year round. That's what their growing temperature is, 65, 75, 80 degrees. That's what they love. Um, now, um, uh, so, so that, that's what the temperature that we'd like to achieve, which means if we start to get below 50 degrees at night, that's usually when I'll bring it back in. So you just kind of have to watch your weather and it's better to bring them in earlier than it is to wait too long. Because while it can take 32 degrees, it can only take it for a few hours. So we don't wanna push even getting close to 32. We'd love for it to not to get below 40. And it just kind of keeps it even keeled and allows for uh, easier uh, transition from outside to inside watching your temperatures and trying to keep them about in that same level if possible. All right, um, so we talked about pruning now. A couple other tips, keep your leaves green or keep your leaves clean. Um, that will keep them green. Um, so sometimes, you know, in our homes, uh, we've got dust, we've got other issues. Uh, you know, check your leaves every once in a while, take a little damp wet uh, washcloth or a paper towel and just wash them off. It does really, really help. Uh, it helps keep that photosynthesis process going, keeps your plants nice and healthy um, and won't stress it out and stressed out plants can cause insect issues. And insect issues, um, we, we, we are gonna see probably a lot more with citrus because we're taking them outside, a lot of us are. A lot of us are gonna take them outside during the summer and bring them back in and that's when we start to get insect issues like aphids um, or scale or mealybug, spider mites, uh, leaf miners. Those are probably like the most major ones uh, that we have issues with. And so a couple of my favorites, of course, are, are all natural, natural guard products. Neem oil, whoop, sorry, backwards. Neem oil is a great one. This is gonna work by suffocation. So you're gonna spray it all over the entire leaves. It's gonna suffocate the insect. It also works well on some uh, fungus issues, which we don't have a lot of fungus or disease issues in citrus typically. Powdery mildew maybe being one, maybe a little bit of rust. Sp Spinosad soap, which is a great one, great for leaf miners. So if you got leaf miner damage, which is fairly common with citrus, then this might be a good one. You, if you read any of the, uh, the, the college uh, pr uh, information on citrus, they're gonna talk about, whoop, that's the wrong one. They're gonna be talking about horticultural oil. Horticultural oil is a great option, especially when it's outside. Just be careful, make sure not to spray oil, neem oil or horticultural oil if the temperatures are above 90 degrees. So, but this is a nice safe one. Again, works by suffocation and it's safe to use. Um, and then of course, one of my bread and butters, which this is not listed as organic, um, but it's very, very close. Um, it uses pyrethrins, which is chrysanthemum oil and neem oil. So it's pretty close. The only reason it's not is because it's got a surfactant in it. Um, but if you buy the concentrate, it is listed, Omri listed as organic, but triple action is my favorite because it kind of does everything. So I like to use it as a preventative. Always be preventative rather than curative. But this is a great option. Always should have a bottle of triple action laying around the house. Uh, in the garage, in the shed, because if you don't know what's going on, you don't have time to come in and let us inspect or look at pictures or bring a leaf into us, then you can almost always use this and you know you're gonna be safe. So triple action is a good option as well. Um, and then if you've got disease issues, which are very uncommon, but powdery mildew or rust, maybe you got some leaf spot, there's not a whole lot out there on citrus, but if you do, then this is a great option. This is made by Monterey. It's disease control, it is organic, it's OMRI listed. Very, very safe for your vegetables, your flowers, your fruit, your citrus, anything that you might have a fungus issue on. This is a very, very specific one to a lot of different types of funguses out there. Um, all right, so uh, let's see, that was kind of my tips and tricks, is keep the leaves clean, watch for insects, so inspect your plants. 
uh, spend a day, I always spend a day kind of walking around looking at my plants. You know, it puts me in a good mood, makes me happy. There's not a whole ton, I mean, there's a lot that you can do outside right now when it's gardening, but it's a great time to kind of look at your plants inside. Uh, let's see, Victoria said, all my leaves fall off every winter. Is that normal? That is not unnormal for sure, Victoria, and especially, um, it, it says I bring it in also, are those products good for vegetable plants too? Yes, all of those are very safe for vegetables. So if you got, uh, Tony, if you've ever got any issues with your vegetables, these are all OMRI listed, very safe products. Uh, if you wanted the triple action, I use this on my vegetable plants. I just get the concentrate because it's OMRI listed. It doesn't have, there's surfactant in it. And that's the only reason that this one does or is not listed OMRI. But great question, Tony. Those are all very safe for any edible plants. I definitely recommend our natural guard products for all of those edible plants. Uh, so Victoria, back to your question. Uh, that's pretty common. I mean, you're taking it from an environment outside that it was happy in and you're bringing it into an indoor space. Try and find maybe a brighter light situation, Victoria. That might help. Watch your watering. Increase humidity really helps. So Victoria, I don't know if you were watching earlier when I talked about humidity, but using a saucer with a, you know, one to two inches of rock in it, putting some water in it, putting your plants on top of that. The moisture won't get wicked into the potting soil as easily, but it will create a humid situation, which is great. Lori, Lori said, I used Happy Frog uh, fertilizer feed uh, and ended up with tiny flies. Would they have hatched from the feed? Uh, most likely not, Lori, but I can't guarantee that. Um, so gnats, small flies, they breed in moist situations with organic matter, which is potting soil. Um, so maybe, Lori, it could have been your potting soil. It maybe was that you had it outside. A gnat got in there, some insect got in there, laid eggs. Um, and then when you brought it inside, the temperature didn't drop. It didn't have to lay dormant, so it didn't go cold. Uh, and we don't want it to. Um, and then the moisture and the heat causes them to uh, grow very quickly, hatch very quickly, breed very quickly, and can continue to do problems. Fungus gnats are a big problem, um, and, and fruit flies are a big problem, um, and a lot of times it comes from soil. Uh, I doubt it came from the food, but it could have. I, I can't rule that out, Lori. Uh, most of your uh, organic fertilizers, like Happy Frog um, and Espoma organic products, are gonna come from turkey litter, chicken litter, um, so maybe something got in there, but a lot of times that's compost. So that's heated up to a pretty high heat that most insect eggs can't live. But I'm not going to say that it couldn't have happened. Um, so I wouldn't say, Lori, if you love Happy Frog, I wouldn't, I, maybe if you think that's where it came from, you've narrowed it down and you're pretty sure that's where it is, maybe get rid of that bag. But I wouldn't say stop using it. If you want to try something else, we've got a couple options. We've got our green leaf. We've got uh, organic citrus tone from Espoma. So there's a couple different options out there for you. Um, so hopefully that helps with your issue. All right, so the last thing I'm gonna do real quick, cause I know we're kind of getting a little late, is I'm just gonna run through some of the varieties that we have in stock right now. So if you're out there saying, I gotta get a citrus now, then you can come in. The first thing I wanna show you is calamundans. Calamundans are awesome. Great little orange, um, really easy to eat, very, very uh, uh, gr uh, uh, used a lot in desserts and drinks. Uh, you can see right here on the other tag, on the tag it says the other lime. Really, really citrusy, really, really yummy to eat. Uh, you can use it as fresh eating, but you can also use it for lots of different things. Kids love them. Gives you a little boost of energy, I love that. You can see this is in a hanging basket. So isn't this cool? So, and I wanted to show you this because you can grow citrus in a hanging basket. Um, because they're dwarf, because they're not gonna grow very fast. They're inside, they're their root system is contained. So if you've got, if you don't have a lot of space, um, then this is a great option because you can always go vertical. You can always hang something in your home and this is a great option. You might have uh, you know, a light, a, a, a room that you're like, you know, this has the best light for what I wanna grow with citrus plant, but I don't have any place to put it on the ground, but I wanna hang it. Here we go, you got an option. So you can also grow citrus in a hanging basket. This is a calamundum. They're very, very uh, easy to grow, uh, really, really good. The next one is a kumquat. So kumquats are one of my favorites. Uh, you eat the skin and everything, you eat the whole thing. Um, Kids love these. I, I really feel like if you're having a bad day or, um, and of course I don't have any fruit on this one, but if you were having a bad day or you just kind of felt lackadaisical or something, eat a, eat a kumquat. It gives you a ton of energy. Um, and it's just like super, super sugary rush. Uh, this variegated one actually isn't as sour as most kumquats. So a lot of kumquats are used, I think, for like marmalades and different types of things, uh, for drinks. Uh, but, but this one, this variegated, you can see that leaf is variegated. 
uh, is very easy to grow, and kumquats are pretty heavy producers. They also can stay on the tree for a long time. So once they start to ripen, they actually the fruit will be variegated um, on this specific variety. Um, and then as that fruit begins to ripen, it'll start to go to an orange color. And then it can stay on the tree for, I think, like three or four months. So that's really cool to have a tree that you can constantly go to and pick for a long time, especially as it gets larger and starts to produce more for you. But again, growing citrus is so much fun because the leaves are pretty. This one's pretty because it's got that variegation to it. So you can see that light, lighter edge on it. Um, and then the fruit is variegated and then it turns to orange and it, the flowers are fragrant. It's just such a fun plant to grow. So kumquats are another one of my favorites. All right, let's go to the, to the lemons real quick. We'll run through the lemons. Or let's see, Jill said, our calamondin lost all its leaves when we brought it inside this fall. Will it come back? Yes, Jill. And another, and a, a lot of people are asking uh, questions about leaf loss. Very common problem. Uh, what I will say also is, what, so I, I mentioned earlier, check your humidity. Uh, you might try the, the, the humid, humidity tray uh, trick where you take a saucer, put some rock in it, put some water in it, place your plant on it. Don't just put your plant in a saucer of water. Use the rock, it's very important. Uh, that'll increase your humidity in the area. Uh, if you feel like it's overwatered, take it outside on a nice warm day. The next chance you get, let it dry out some. Um, you might also try, uh, check your fertilization, but don't overwater. That I think is another common problem that people, a mistake that people make is I've got leaf loss. I'm trying to, I see green, I see some buds starting to form. I wanna push it, let me keep watering it. Water is not gonna help that situation. There's not a lot of leaves on it, so it's probably not gonna use a lot of water. So Jill, just kind of watch your watering. Uh, I don't think I would feed it necessarily. Want, we want it to re-thrive. If, if it doesn't seem to be coming back and you're getting a little bit more worried, that's super thrive trick. This is a great option to kind of help rejuvenate. Let it dry out before you use it because you do have to apply it with water, your next watering, but this is a great option. All right, and then I see uh, Meyer Lemon has over 100 blooms now. Should we thin out the blooms? So Denise, great question. I'm just about to talk about Meyer Lemons. Meyer Lemons are awesome. Um, it's a very, very sweet, very good lemon, easy to use. It's not huge, so it's a good medium-sized lemon. You get lots of production, as Denise is mentioning. Uh, you can see all these white blooms starting to come on it now. So it's a very high producer. It can actually start to produce throughout the years. It's very disease and insect, or not insect, but disease resistant. Uh, it doesn't have a lot of issues. Uh, it's one of the best out there. People love Meyer lemons. Now, to your question, Denise, on thinning them out, I don't think I would necessarily. I would let them go for now. Um, what typically citrus trees and all fruit trees will do um, is they'll thin themselves out if they need to. So if they, if they can't hold on to all of its fruit, it's gonna drop some of it. So do expect that, Denise, maybe. If you've got a ton of blooms and a ton of fruit set, and the plant says to itself, I can't support all of this, it's gonna naturally drop all of it. It's gonna survive, it's gonna, it's gonna take itself first and say, I've gotta survive this. I produced way too much, great, but I can't hold on to all of it, so I'm gonna drop some of it. So expect some of those fruits to drop, and that's fine, that's completely normal. For now, I don't think I would thin them necessarily. There is a technique out there um, where you can take some of the buds off, you know, take your biggest flower bud, your first flower bud, whatever it might be, um, take the other ones off and let all the energy go into one. That helps produce bigger fruit, but maybe you want more fruit. So, I, and I typically wouldn't mess with it. Let it be, let it do its natural thing. The only thing that I would recommend in these is make sure that you're feeding it enough, that it has enough energy. So using something like a citrus tone or a McDonald green leaf, in conjunction with uh, a, a chelated liquid iron, which would be great, another source of iron. Uh, I definitely would recommend keep doing that. Um, and then just watching it and making sure that you're okay. Stay on the right watering schedule. Um, it sounds like you're doing everything right. You got 100 blooms, so you're doing great. Uh, let's see, Veronica said, I grew a Meyer from seed. Should I graft the new plant so we'll start producing? The plant is about two and a half years old. So Veronica, the tricky thing about growing citrus, fruit, anything, from seed is it probably came from a grafted plant. And so that's the problem, Veronica, is you might not get fruit. I hate to tell you that. Um, and, I, and I could be wrong. It's hard to say where you got the seed from. Um, you know, you got it from a lemon, obviously. But, um, but if it didn't come from a mire that was grown from seed originally, then what happens typically is that root stalk, that, graft, that grafted root, um, is gonna create that seed to not create the exact same lemon plant that you got it from. So for example, let's take a Granny Smith apple. So a Granny Smith apple, 
If we got one from the store and we planted the seed, you'll get an apple tree, but it'll probably be wild. It's most likely not going to be a Granny Smith apple unless that Granny Smith apple came from the original, not the original, but a, a true grown uh, apple tree. And that's the hard thing. The good news is, is the reason that they're grafted. So Veronica, you know, check on it. See, you might even bring a leaf into us if you're local um, and let us look at it. Maybe we can dis distinguish if you're actually going to get um, a Meyer lemon. Hard to say because we don't know where that Meyer lemon came from. Yes, it's a Meyer lemon. But if that Meyer lemon came from a grafted tree, which almost all of them are these days, then most likely you did not get a Meyer lemon plant, unfortunately. So you might consider getting a Meyer lemon if that's what you really wanted. Um, if your plant is about two and a half years old, you should have started seeing blooms. If you haven't seen any blooms, uh, then it might be a wild citrus tree, basically, or a, a, a more aggressive root system citrus tree. Um, so you might talk to a friend. Maybe you've got a friend that has a Meyer lemon that you can graft onto maybe what you've grown, which is probably a wild uh, citrus plant of some sort. Maybe it'll never bloom. Maybe it'll be 10 to 15 years. I don't know. It's very difficult to answer that question. I'm just throwing out a lot of different options there for you, Veronica. So I hope that helps. Uh, but it's very difficult to grow uh, a true citrus plant or fruit tree of any kind from a seed because most likely it came from a graft. And when it comes from a grafted grown plant, you're not going to get a true seed out of that plant, unfortunately. Sorry, uh, but hopefully that helps. Check it out. You know, look, look around and see if you can get any other answers. But I, I believe that's probably what you're going to see. At two and a half years old, you probably should see, especially if you're in, I mean, this kind of size, you know, this kind of size plant after two and a half years. I mean, you can see this one's blooming and you should have started to see blooms already. Maybe it's not setting fruit, but you should have at least seen a, bl a bloom. So hopefully that helps. Uh, um, all right, so the next thing is I just kind of want to keep on showing some, some of the citrus plants real quick. This is just to show you the varieties. Uh, Ponderosa lemon, gigantic lemon. I mean, it's like, I think I wrote it down. I think it's like two to four pounds is how big this lemon gets. So a huge lemon. Um, and you're gonna see these branches bend a little bit with this lemon. It's a really, really cool one. We did a blog a couple years ago. If you wanna go and look on our website, it has a picture of it, it's gigantic. So these are really, really cool. This is fun to grow. Um, I still love the Meyer because you're gonna get a high production. Um, the bears that I kept on pulling up, so this is the bears lemon. The bears bush lemon is what we call it. This is another variety, just a very, very different you know, type of variety uh, of lemon. Um, and so you know, just another option. Uh, we've also got a variegated lemon, so a variegated leaf lemon. So that just adds a little bit of different color. Nice looking plant. Showed you the calamanda and the kumquat. All right, so then limes. Everybody loves limes. Uh, kind of the mainstay with uh, any kind of, uh, of, of cocktail, any kind of drink that you might be making, mango lime salsa, all those different types of things. Um, so this is a key lime or a Mexican lime. Uh, very, very easy to grow. Uh, these are great. They're kind of like perfectly round um, limes. You're gonna see these a lot used for cocktails because they got a really, really good fruit, a really, really good uh, a juice content, um, and they're very easy to grow. Um, they do take a little bit longer to produce than a typical lime, but they're very, very good and highly prized. For anybody like a professional cocktail maker, this is the lime that they're after, is uh, this uh, Mexican or key lime. Also, of course, great in your key lime pies. We also carry the Persian lime, which is probably your most common lime out there. So if you're growing limes for production, if you're growing limes for ease, uh, you might consider this one as your first one because you're gonna get a little bit of higher producer. It's very common, it's a very easy lime to grow. So that is your Persian lime, just another option. And then the last thing I wanna show you that we also have in stock is a key lime and Meyer lime in one. So you can see we've got two, root, two stalks there. Let's see if I can show that to you. So we got two main stalks, one of them's a lime and one of them's a lemon. And so that's perfectly fine to grow them that way. And so on this one plant, two plants, in one pot, we can get uh, lemons and limes on one little pot. So it's a really, really cool option there for you as well. There's other citrus out there that you might see. Um, I'm sure there's some rarer varieties out there that are harder for us to find, uh, but we carry a pretty consistent uh, stock of citrus trees. It always depends on and majority of these come from Florida and there's a lot of regulations on them so we got to make sure that we can get them but we typically have them here we're always trying to get uh, new varieties if we can if we know that they're proven and they do well but these are some of our favorites Ponderosa, Meyer, Key Lime, 
Mexican line, um, or the Persian line, and then the Kalamundans and the Kumquats. So those are some of our favorites. You're gonna find some oranges, maybe some grapefruits every once in a while, uh, but these are kind of our mainstays. These are the ones that we believe do the best, um, and we know that you'll be successful with them. So with those couple tips, I know that was a lot of information packed in there, um, but our videos will be posted on our website. So I'll go back and look and see if I can answer any questions that maybe I missed. I think I got everybody's that rejoined here with us. So let me just make sure. Yep, I think I got everybody's that was here. A lot of leaves falling off, I know, I know. That happened to mine too. Just let it restore, just do your normal thing. Um, it's usually because of uh, the change of uh, temperature, change of its home. Uh, looks like I think I got everybody on that on this feed at least. So I'll go back and look at the other one and if I missed anything, I'll try and answer them there. I hope everybody has a great day. Enjoy growing citrus. If you're not growing it, you should come in and pick one out. They're so much fun. The fragrance of the blooms, the glossy green leaves or variegated leaves. Uh, they're pretty easy, they're pretty simple. Get on a little bit of a, of a, of a plan. Uh, think about the space that you're gonna grow it. Think about how you're gonna grow it. Um, and then all those other things are just tips and tricks. So, you know, when to prune, you know, repotting, the watering, all of that stuff, pretty easy to figure out. This is, you know, kind of my go-to little lifesaver here. If you're ever curious, this is a great option to pick up is your moisture, light, and pH meter. Uh, Kathy said, did you say the sm uh, Smart Thrive was like Quick Start? No, kind of different. So this is Super Thrive. Uh, Super Thrive is, um, is a, uh, a vitamin supplement. It basically takes the shock off of a plant. A lot of people use it with bonsai plants. It's a great way to kind of tell people how this works is bonsais are stressed because they're in a tiny little pot. The root system can't go anywhere. It's designed to grow that way. It's okay. Um, but to take some of that shock off and make sure that it can thrive, Super Thrive is used. They also use this when they transplant massive trees. So think of like huge, great old live oaks that they want to move then they use barrels of this stuff and it works great for transplant. It's just shock. I won't say it's a root stimulator. It's not a, it's not something that I would use when I plant a brand new plant. I would use, you know, my biotone starter or a root stimulator. Uh, but this is something that I always have around in case I don't know what's going on with the plant. I don't see any insects. I don't see any fungus. I know I'm watering right. It's got the right light. Everything that I'm doing is right. I know it is. Then you might try this because it's going through some sort of shock and this will take the shock off. So hopefully that helps. Super Thrive, I always have it around. Another great way of, sh uh, of telling you about this is I had a really old camellia uh, at, my old, at my other gardens uh, in Hampton when we had the garden center there. And I, big old kind of ugly one in a big huge pot. And it was just kind of awful looking and, and it was either going in a dumpster or going home with somebody for less than nothing. And so what I did was I just cut it off at the base and I gave it a bunch of Super Thrive. I mean, I didn't cut it right to soil level. I cut about a foot off, off soil level. But this thing was like 15 feet tall in a pot. Super stressed, really old, struggling, you know, just really wasn't, wasn't able to even take up nutrients. I'm sure we fed it a lot and fertilized it and, and watered it a lot. And we just couldn't get it going. I put a bunch of Super Thrive, so I poured probably, I think I used a whole bottle on it. But for $14.99, and in two years, this was the prettiest camellia you've ever seen. It was six by six, it was gorgeous, it was perfectly shaped, and you've never seen more blooms. So this stuff really helps take the shock, kick the funk off of a plant. It's a great little thing to have laying around in case you don't know what it is. Um, so Ella said, thank you. Lori said, a lot of great information. Thank you for the webinar, very helpful. Great, I'm glad everybody enjoyed this. I hope everybody has a great day. I know there was a lot of information in there, but you can always go back and watch these. We'll also get our notes posted as soon as we possibly can. So we'll get our notes up on our website um, here in the next you know, five to six days. We'll get them up on the website and we'll be ready to roll um, into our new webinar series. So let me check real quick, just cause I'm not 100% sure off the top of my head. Okay, it's, uh, next week is uh, how and what to prune. Um, and what I'm gonna be talking about there is specifically what to prune right now. And then we'll be talking about orchids as we get closer to Valentine's Day. We'll be talking about Valentine's Day even closer on February 10th. And then we're gonna be talking about aeroids February 17th, and then indoor using grow lights for indoor gardening on February 24th. And then spring is gonna be here pretty quickly after that. And so we'll start rolling into spring and we've got lots and lots of topics coming uh, as we start to warm up. I couldn't get more excited uh, to get out there and plant uh, flowers in the garden and start talking about vegetable gardening and herb gardening and everything. So we got lots and lots of topics. It's endless, the possibilities are endless. So enjoy your day, have a great day. Um, great to be back. 
excited for the new year and we'll be talking to you soon. So let us know if you need anything. Have a great day.